Welcome into this edition of Floyd Street's Finest. He's Coach Mark Lieberman. I'm Jack Grossman. Thanks so much for tuning in. As you can see, I'm back here in Atlanta now after being in Louisville for Thanksgiving. Coach, did you guys have a good, happy, and, and fun Thanksgiving weekend? Time spent with my little one, my daughter. So, yeah, it was good. It was good. I saw some pictures of you and uh, of your family and all the food that you had. So I'm sure you had a great time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, the Grossman family has fun with Thanksgiving. <laughs> that's that's for sure. I'm glad you enjoyed it as well. There's truly I, – I think that's just my favorite holiday of the year. Just all the food, all the family, friends, and, of course, a lot of basketball on as well, which never hurts. And it was a really fun feast week this past week. Louisville, though, comes back from New York City. They play New Mexico State and Bellarmine. Two games that were, were were viewed a little differently, I would I would argue, just because you know there's a lot of respect for Bellarmine in the city for what Scott Davenport has done with that program, to where people know that they can come up and beat teams. They know that that they're you know they play that unique style of offense to where yeah you know, they don't they don't dribble the ball a lot, a lot of passing, a lot of ball movement, patience, all those things. And then you had New Mexico State, a program that folded in, in February due to various scandals that we don't need to get too deep into, has an entirely new team, new coaching staff, new everything, to where I think if you would have asked me before they played those two games that they went 2-0, and I probably would have been fine with it, or I would I would think the fan base would have been fine with it just because, you know, kind of going back to what we did with UMBC, you know, they're at a spot to where – they just kind of need to win games, but the, especially the New Mexico State game. I think Bellarmine's one thing. I think the anger that we've seen from the fan base from the Bellarmine game has been more of a culmination of everything else than it has been just the Bellarmine game at, itself, even though Bellarmine was playing without Ben Johnson, who was who's their leading scorer and best three-point shooter, and playing without their starting setter as well. So, well, New Mexico State, I feel like, is more of the game where, okay, you needed overtime to beat that team, and you needed six dudes to foul out and to shoot 49 free throws to do it. I, I, I think the big picture of is this program going in the right direction? Yes, they. it's November 30th, and they've already matched as many wins as they had last year. But I'm struggling to do the, hey, they won games, let's praise them for winning games thing that, that I feel like I kind of did after the UMBC game. I, the question for me becomes, are we seeing enough of an improvement even in wins against low major teams to where they're really struggling to win a couple of these games? Yeah, I, I, the wins, you know, they, they can they can mask some of the mistakes, some of the uh, perception of, of what's happening on the floor. Look, it, it's, it's good to win games. You need to win those games. But, you know – the the proverbial eye test that people want to see and they want to see a dominant performance in those two games yeah it's just not there you know they're they're trailing both games at the half they the, uh, the good part is they've come out and scored you know 50 some odd points in in both second halves and they've been in attack mode and so on but yeah to 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 struggle um against these type of guarantee type of teams that you're 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 basically okay you're getting prepared for Virginia Tech on Sunday, your first ACC matchup, and Kentucky down the line, and so on. Yeah, it's 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 not uh, you know it's not pretty, but it certainly is. It, it certainly is uh, where you just want to see. Okay, this is what they are. This is who they're becoming, and they're you know they're struggling to fight back against teams that they should beat by twenty. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, if you were to beat UMBC by 15 to 20, if you were to just simply beat Chattanooga, if you beat New Mexico State by 15 to 20, people can swallow beating Bellarmine by six or, or by mm -hmm. five. It was right. because, you know, again, going back to people respect Bellarmine a lot in the city of Louisville. Scotty D runs a really good program there. Like, like yes, it's a low major, but people – you can rationalize that just within itself. It's when sure. you combine it with everything else that it really becomes okay. You got to beat Bellerman by more than by more than five points when Bellerman's playing down two starters with one of them being their their you know best player in terms of scoring and three point shooting. And it, and on top of it all, you look at that first half. 
You score 22 points in the first half against an Atlantic Sun team. You have, again, Bellerman's starting center has been out all year. Brandon Hutley, Hatfield, J.J. Trader, and Dennis Evans combined for zero points and six rebounds in the first half. That's not taking advantage of where the strength should have been in that game. Now, they were much better in the second half, especially Huntley Hatfield. He was a lot more aggressive, and the team as a whole was a lot more aggressive. But you got to figure out a way to do that for more than five, six minutes in a game. Because I felt like Louisville played five, six minutes of good basketball against Bellarmine last night. And that was from about the 14-and-a-half-minute mark through the 10-minute mark where they went on a 14-to-1 run, built up a 12-point lead, and then mm-hmm. just kind of did barely enough to hold Bellarmine off. The rest of the way, way you, I thought against New Mexico State, Louisville played about a minute and a half of good basketball, and that was when they were down eight with about you know ninety seconds left, whatever the heck it was, and they got really desperate and were able to force overtime, thanks to to honestly partly New Mexico State's coach icing his own free throw shooter with a with a second and a half left, <laughs> which I gotta ask you about that. Yeah. New Mexico State heading to the line, tie game, second and a half left. Coach calls timeout. Would you ever do anything like that in that situation? You know, the perception of icing a shooter, sometimes, you know, you might notice something and want to calm them down. I'm not anti, you know, calling a timeout with a guy shooting a free throw. I know that's the the pervert, you know, that's the term, hey, icing a guy and, and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's a feel. You have a pulse of your players and – so I, I can understand from the perspective from, from from fans and from media that, that that's the never the right thing to do. For me, it's not that big a deal, um, especially if you know what kind of kids you have. Um, having said that, you know you, you want to make sure you're setting up if, if what you're going to do defensively, if you if you make, if you miss, or so on. So, um, but in that situation, probably not. So yeah, there's it, your there's your there's your answer. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get. I'll give you this. I remember, and, and this is a very sore spot for Louisville fans. Uh, the 2004 Louisville Kentucky game, where Patrick Sparks gets fouled, and a lot of Louisville fans would say he walked before he got fouled. <laughs> fouled, and Tubby Smith, either Tubby Smith or Patino, or there's review or something. But there's a there's a large gap in play that was kind of similar to this situation. And of course, Kentucky was down one at that point, so there's even more pressure on Sparks than there was on the New Mexico State kid with the game tied. But I remember seeing that Tubby Smith says, after Patrick Sparks hits these three free throws, here's what we're going to do. And that's something that worked in that case because Sparks hit three free throws. Mm -hmm. Kentucky ended up stealing that game in Freedom Hall. But I would have rather of them, you know, oh, in terms of like icing the shooter, I I have no idea if if it actually works. I know people, when they miss the free throws or miss a field goal or something like that, people like to say that. But I would have rather them let, let him shoot the first free throw then if he if he makes or misses his, misses it, then you call the timeout no matter what to where you can set up your defense, not give Louisville the timeout after the second free throw if he were to make it to set up mm-hmm. a play and be able to uh, organize themselves. But then you at least get the first free throw. If he makes it, then you have the lead. You know what you're getting into. If you miss it, then then you can do the uh, you know the Tubby Smith thing of you know you're going to make the second one. And then here's what we're going to do type of deal deal. But you know obviously it did work out Louisville got incredibly lucky on that and was able to steal the game anyways. But that's two games where you played probably about five and a half, six, seven minutes of good basketball against two low major teams. That was enough to win both of the games. But I think the fan base at this point, like if you were to do that last season, they would say, okay, year one, whatever. Like, fine. You're winning games. We take it. it, it. It's fine. But you look at it this year, I think there's a lot more pressure, obviously, on Kenny right now to to not just win games, but to look good doing it. And they just haven't done that against these low major teams, compounding with the fact that they had chances to win against Texas and Indiana up in New York and weren't able to pull either of those out. Yeah, they're, they're trying to find out, even on the rotations and who's going to play, and then you kind of limit that in the second half. Um Obviously, the Tyler situation as well, but uh, which we'll we'll we'll, yeah. we'll talk about. But uh, yeah, it, it's it's you're you're not seeing okay. This team, you, you know, you could sit here and argue and 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 say, well, well, are, are they are they getting better incrementally better? You know, are they just surviving? Are they just finding 
you know, a weaker opponent and having some some high major division one athletes and, and get into the line and scoring and so on. So, yeah, there's it, it's the school of thought here is, yeah, you still just don't know what you have with this Louisville basketball team. You know, you just don't know if this is something, you know, are they going to are they going to when they go to Virginia Tech, are they going to play like they did against Texas? Um, there's just you just don't know who they are. They have an identity crisis right now. Yeah, they do. And that's something that, unfortunately, I, I'll put it this way. The best case scenario for Louisville basketball right now is that they have an identity crisis. They don't know who they are but they figure it out against Virginia Tech or or against the ACC schedule in January or even against the last couple uh, non-con games they have with DePaul and Pepperdine and Arkansas State. The worst case scenario is that this is who they are and they're just surviving these guarantee games. And once they start playing actual opponents, New York City was just a blimp and you weren't able to take advantage of those good performances with wins. And then you start tumbling down again. I think that Mm -hmm. those are kind of the two sides of it yeah. now, now, and and you're trying to figure out which one of these is this here? Because if it's the second one, then it's going to get really ugly. And even if it's the first one, that might not be a team that wins. Like I had a friend last night that said, "Hey, Louisville could win seven ACC games," and I go, "Which seven are you looking at right now?" Because like you know, Notre Dame, they're 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 a mess. Mess. You get them at home. You get get. I believe I'm a. Uh, I think it's Wake Forest, not Wake Forest. They uh they beat Florida last night. Right? Uh-huh. Um, right. But but you get, you know, some games like Boston College. Yeah, maybe. Boston College. That's who I'm trying to think of. Boston mm-hmm. College at home. Home, which Ken Palm has Boston College uh beating Louisville in the come center, actually, right now. Georgia Tech is the other one who I'm thinking of who just beat a top 25 Mississippi State team last night. I mean, like the ACC, I I, I want to get to this later, but I'm gonna say this now. The ACC was really impressive in the ACC SEC challenge. Other than, you know, Miami kind of getting blown out by Kentucky, which I think that says more about Kentucky than it does Miami, and and Duke losing to a very desperate Arkansas team. You had Georgia Tech upset Mississippi State. You had North Carolina hang 100 on the best defense in the country statistically right now in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. You had, you know, Wake Forest beat Florida. You had – um. Uh, Clemson go into Tuscaloosa and beat Alabama. The ACC fared really good in the ACC SEC challenge. And it, it, I think the conference, it's not back to where it was like the Zion Williamson year where they had three number one seeds and were, were historically great or like what the ACC has traditionally been. But I do think you have a clear top with, with uh, Miami, with Duke, with North Carolina, Virginia got a big win over Texas A&M as well. And you're showing that you have a little bit more depth than what they've had the last few years to where what's are going to be hard to come by for Louisville in the ACC this year. And that's something that, that um, looking at what they're doing right now, yes, you're winning games, but you got to show me that you can beat competent teams. And there's a lot more competent teams in the ACC than what there were the last couple of years. Yeah, there, there, there certainly is. And, and, and we just talked about the identity crisis. You just don't know what you're going to get. I mean, it's almost like Forrest Gump right now with a, with a box of chocolates because <laughs> you're not sure what's going to happen when this team starts getting into ACC play. Um, they've got more games coming up that they can show their medal and, and, and show, okay, this is what we're trying to do. This is how we want to play consistently um, through Virginia Tech. And then they have the non-conference with DePaul, Arkansas State and Pepperdine. obviously Pepperdine and then Kentucky down the road. So you can finish – you know, with a, with a, a a way to feel good about yourself, what your team is kind of have a pulse. If you're coach Payne about who you are and what your team can do and not just having to scratch and claw the fight back in some of these games, but no, take a, take a, take a lead, get stops, uh, do the things that you want, go into halftime and build on that and put teams away early in the second half. And I think one of the things they can do to really help with that is I I know there was the whole tights thing with Tyler Johnson <laughs> in, in, in a Wednesday night's game, which first of all, before we get any farther, have you ever had a situation like that with a player where they didn't have, it didn't have to be tights or just some type of equipment to where they're like, I can't play without like this, these tights or like this arm sleeve or like these specific shoes or something like that. And how would you react to to if a player said that? Well, I, I call those things props. And to me, those are things you have to earn. 
um, you know, props with the with the headband, the the sleeves, the the certain socks, and so on. But you know, some players are, are adamant about what they're wearing. In fact, when I was at Southeastern Louisiana, we had to send a manager back to the to the. Um, we were playing Louisville here, and one of our better players he did not have his tights, and we had to send a manager to run to the hotel, which was not too far from the Yum, to go get them. But he would have played without them, but he needed them because it's it's almost a mental thing to how they feel, you know. And, and that's really uh, – I don't want to admonish Coach uh, Payne or, you know, I, I, look, you know, you shouldn't refuse to play, of course, but I, I see it way too often where players, you know, just the, the part of looking good, you know, um, is, is so important to them. Um, if you've ever seen a feature on Jerry Rice – he would talk about how immaculate he'd have to be. His everything had to be clean. Everything had to be perfect, or he, you know, it'd be tough for him to take the field. So, um, uh, not to dance uh, 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 too far around that question. Yeah, you know, you still got to go out there and play. Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, first of all, on Stun Kenny Payne talked about it in the presser, which I, I oh, think yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's more to do with kind of him feeling the pressure of where he's at right now, now because there's not, I, I don't think so. I, I just think that that's, I don't think it's a pressure thing. I think he is, if you've noticed, I, I don't think when he goes up there, there's a filter. I think he's going to say exactly what he thinks. I think if something happens, um, you know, he's going to mention it. Um, you know, I, I just think that's the way he, he feels he needs to present um, his program, not realizing that that's going to be a huge topic for debate. Yeah, I, I think which I don't know if you've seen the audio of it, but he's kind of he's kind of chuckling as he's saying it to where you know there's been other times like you know just last week when he said that Woodson tricked him with the two three zone where I don't think he really realized what he was saying. I, I think this time he kind of do like okay, this is going to be a big thing, but like you can ask the question, why did Tyler Johnson play three minutes in the first half, and there really isn't it. A, a, t- a tactical answer for why you would do that is like he wasn't in foul trouble. He, you know, didn't really do anything. Then he wasn't missing a bunch of defensive assignments or anything like that. Like they gave him the out to say it in the question. I'm not sure who asked the question, but the question goes, did he miss defensive assignments or something? And that's why you took him out. He had to reset. So he had that opportunity to take that out. But honestly, as much as we, as I've especially been critical of Kenny Payne at press conferences, I kind of do enjoy the freshness of him just being honest and saying what happened. It raises other questions about, you know, kind of how that happens and what happens there. But, but I do think it's, you know, it, I'll put it this way. It's the only explanation he could have given, even it being very Louisville basketball in terms of nothing goes normal or, or smoothly over there the last few years. Mm-hmm. But, it's the only injury he could have given that I feel like people wouldn't have gotten completely angry at him over. And that was simply to tell the truth at, at that point. So I don't know whether it's credit or what it is. I, I do like that. He told the truth. And it gave us, you know, three minutes of, of discussing mm-hmm. on this, but I do want to say this about, about Tyler Johnson. We've seen it consistently now over the course of, of the last five games, especially to where he comes in and really, you know, all season, honestly, I, I, I we talked about this in, in the exhibition games to where he comes in and Louisville runs. You talk about identity crisis and all these things. Louisville seems to know what they want to do when Tyler Johnson's on the court. And that's attack the basket, have him try to beat people off the dribble and either, you know, try to score, get to the free throw line or set someone else up, play through the paint get up, get all the paint touches that Kenny Payne wants to talk about. On the other end, Tyler pressures the ball and gets into people and, and really, you know, is not that he's Russ Smith or Peyton Siva when it comes to defending on the perimeter, but he's easily their best perimeter ball on, on ball defender. He's much better, I think, than, than Sky Clark and Trey White and Mike James when it comes to that aspect. He's a guy, though, that through seven games has only played 25 minutes or more twice. And that was against Texas up in New York, where he played 25 minutes, and New Mexico State on Sunday, where he played 30 minutes, but needed overtime to get there. Other than that, he played, I get it, he played the last 15 and a half minutes of the game last night, but he played 19 minutes last night with the with the whole tights thing. So we'll kind of push that aside. 17 minutes against Indiana in a game where 
he quite literally turned that game around for Louisville until Indiana went to the 2-3 zone late in the game. 19 minutes against Coppin State, 16 minutes in, in the loss against Chattanooga, and 21 minutes against UNBC. I think if you're Louisville, I don't know whether or not you should be starting Tyler Johnson because I I know, you know, like Cal Perry's been doing that thing right now with not starting Reed Shepard or, 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 or uh, Rob Dillingham and trying to figure out where guys fill their roles best. But Louisville looks a lot better when Tyler Johnson's in the game. And I think Kenny Payne needs to, whether he starts him or not, he needs to be playing starters type minutes, 25, 30 plus minutes a game to where, where I think, you know, seven games, still a smallish sample size, but we're, we're starting to get to that point now to where we're almost a quarter of the way through the season. Like, we can see this consistently where Tyler Johnson has been effective for Louisville. Even if he's not always shooting the ball great, he makes things happen for Louisville that other guys just don't just do not do for Louisville. To where, do you think he should be playing more minutes? How do you think Kenny Payne could work him in more? And just, just what has been the impact that he's really had, both in, in, in terms of the Bellarmine game last night and really in these last stretch of games? Well, he's a natural point guard, so – he, you talk about the defensive, you know, his pickup points and understanding how to how to be a gnat defensively and even off the ball is pretty good. But offensively, he knows even without look when he's playing in the open court, he's going to make uh, a good decision. He's going to get he's going to go downhill. He knows how to navigate ball screens. He gets in the paint. He creates those open threes. I mean, the start of the second half, you know, he gets he, he he's able to penetrate and and get Sky Clark an open three in the corner. So look, he's gonna find shooters. Guys collapse on him. He's he knows he has a field. So for his minutes, I'm sure they're gonna go up exponentially. Um, as far as starting, it could help them get out of the gate uh, quicker. Um, this team could go smaller. And that might be more effective for them where they're playing maybe one big and, you know, they have a, a you know, it's whether it's Trey, Mike, uh, Mike James. Sky, oh, wow. So you're saying Tyler, going really and, small. That's uh, that's you know, like, like Rick Patino, Bridgie or Cal Keurig at the four small. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if you're not going to get the production out of some of those guys anyway, and look, I think an overhaul, even defensively, I think this team could be a lot better if they really extend their pressure. Um, they haven't been very good in the half court, so why not extend it and pressure and have uh, quicker defenders out there um, regardless? Um, but as far as Tyler, I, I see his minutes are going to go up. He's going to play more because he's going to help them win, and you have to have people on the floor. He is, the, he is a quintessential uh, point. So by not having a quarterback on the floor, really it kind of erases some of the things that you do as a, you know, um, having to overcoach and, and, and worry about sets and so on. He can just break a play and make a play. So he's the type of guy you need to have on the floor for sure. Yeah. And I think he's looking at the Bellarmine game on, on Wednesday night. I mean, it's pretty clear. He plays three minutes in the first half. Louisville doesn't draw a foul on Bellarmine until the 124 mark in the first half. And Louisville doesn't attempt a free throw in the first 20 minutes. He comes in and they shoot 22 free throws in the second half. I get it like five or six of them were, were garbage time, just Bellarmine trying to foul late in the game to extend the game out. But but you, you were still shooting 16, 17 free throws in the first 16, 17 minutes of the half, like a, a free throw a minute. That's pretty damn good. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where Louisville's been at their best offensively is attacking and getting to the free throw line and really, you know, getting free and easy points. That's how they've made their offense go. And they and they do that their best when Tyler Johnson's in the game. And as far as the slow starts go, I think that would help immensely if he were to start. All right. I, I hadn't really thought about them going that small with Mike James or, or Trey White at the four, especially when you face, I think back to the Indiana game where they really punished both of those guys with, with Malik Renu late in that game, game off of switches to where if you're playing a bigger team, like a Duke or a Carolina, I'm not sure you can do that, but you're playing, you know, DePaul or Pepperdine or Arkansas state, or, you know, some of these other teams, teams I think that's definitely something that could work. And obviously if you do do that, you got to, the bigger team's got to defend you on the other end as well, which which well, that's the thing. would have to take advantage right. of. And, and then you just have to have some grit defensively. You you have to have that regardless of who's in. But then there's the challenge of, okay, this, these, we have to guard these guys. And that that makes it where you have to extend and bring your bigs out to guard some of those other guys. So, yeah, there's there's always 
there's always pluses and minuses. I'm always, okay, how can we attack this team? What's our best way to attack them and put them to compromise them defensively as well? As you guys know by now, we've partnered with BetMGM Sportsbook for this college basketball season. We're going to be using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks and predictions throughout the college basketball season. And we are going to have special offers for you, the listeners and the viewers on the field of 68, each and every week during the season. If you haven't signed up with BetMGM yet, use the bonus code FIELD1500 and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager on BetMGM Sportsbook. Here's what you got to do. Download the BetMGM app. Sign up using the bonus code FIELD1500. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game. You will receive up to $1,500 in bonus bets if that bet loses. Just make sure you use the bonus code FIELD1500 when you sign up. And remember, BetMGM is now available under one wallet in select states. As a New Jersey resident, this is super convenient for me when I have to go cover games in New York or Philly. When cross the state borders, just log into your existing account instead of having to create new accounts in each state that you go to. And most importantly, I got to let you know, we do have some fun stuff coming up for this college basketball season. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops odds boosts, my personal favorite, parlay odds boosts. So download the Bet MGM app today. You brought it up with extending pressure. Um, we've talked about this before, how you know they're not going to do the Rick Pitino thing where they're going to press all 40 minutes. So that's just not their MO on defense. But do you think they should be throwing more of that 2 2 1 press out there? Maybe, and even if you're not. Pressing full court all game, game just trying to uh, pressure more in the half court, trying to get up into people and trying to push the offense back more. More is that more you're talking about, or, or do you truly think that they should go more like two two one press or full court man man trying to uh, really pick up full court more often? Well, or they've both. shown they've shown a token full court man, yeah, where they're you know, but but it's almost like one guy's denying, and then sometimes they allow a pressure release and the guy to catch it. It's got to be where they're connected, where they're saying, okay, we're going to make this a really tough catch. Maybe look for a smart trap in the backcourt just to speed up and take teams out of their rhythm offensively because that's where uh, Louisville struggles. So if if it's changing those dynamics and just doing a full court man and really trying to make it tough and not just easy to inbound and then make your pickup points harder for the other teams to bring the ball up, limit the shot clock, really get into guys, maybe a, a, a trap, um, you know, 80 feet from the basket, just to, to hey, look, you're, you're changing the shot clock, you're changing the team's rhythm, and but it takes a concerted effort defensively if you're going to do that. It does, and it, it's something to where I feel like you really got to practice that a lot as well, really kind of make yes. that your DNA to where, you know, teams can't just go in and decide one day, oh, we're going to press, like we're going to be – Rick Pitino's teams at Louisville or, or the 40 minutes of hell with, uh, with Arkansas back in the nineties. It, it's something yeah, and you that, don't, yeah. yeah, you don't have to do that. You just, you, you know, you don't have to be a team that's constantly pressuring, but once the ball goes through the sense of urgency, that okay, now we've got to find our guy. Now we're, 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 we're all in a stance. We're all alert. So the ball gets in. Now they have to process. They're not just going to catch it, bring the ball up, run their stuff. They've got to process it. It takes time off the clock. And that can there's just got to be little little tidbits that you can do to help your team defensively when you're struggling. Yeah, which that's a small thing. If an offense is starting their it, it is starting to run their sets or run their motion or whatever with you know 22 21 seconds on the shot clock instead of 26, it doesn't it's sound huge. like much, but it, it it really is it, huge. It's it's huge. Um, when we're you know in in the in the world of college basketball, that takes a huge amount. Um, because if the initial offense, if you've done your scouting and you've taken away their initial sets and some, now it turns into a flat ball screen, sometimes that, that's got to be quicker and you don't have nine or 10 seconds, you have four or five. And as you said, Jack, that's a huge difference. Why is it? Because that's one thing like watching, you always hear both, both on that with full court pressing and kind of in, in the half court when teams are really able to pressure the ball and kind of push the offense out three, four feet to where you're not at the three-point line. Maybe you're three, four, five feet beyond the three-point line. Why do those small things really throw offenses out of their rhythm and really make things difficult for them? Well, you, you got guys not in the right spot. So, for example, even if you're pressuring and a guy has to come up with pressure release and and I'm I'm the initiator of setting a pin down, I'm in the wrong spot. So now I've got to get to a place that 
Uh, now I've got to go from the, the top of the key or extended back out wide to set a wide pin down. That's two or three seconds. I talked about the difference between nine seconds and six seconds with a flat ball screen. Let's say I come off that ball screen. I'm driving downhill. I kick to the corner and there's five or six seconds left. I can shot fake and drive. But if there's one or two seconds left, I've got to take that shot with a guy closing out on me. So when you extend pressure and you use more of the clock, you have you don't have the opportunity to maybe drive and make a secondary play off of the initial of the of the late action. You've got to do something immediate. So you can take away, you can corral that first that late ball screen, force a pass, and now you're you're you're, you're forcing a tougher shot where guys don't have a chance to drive a closeout because of you so much of the shot clock. I always find that interesting because, you know, I kind of see it like, like, you know, going back to Marquette and Purdue last week where Marquette was able to kind of get back in that game in the second half. One, Purdue started, stopped hitting every three they threw up. They started out 9-12 from beyond the arc. They, they, they weren't but, missing. Yeah, they yeah. were not missing at all. But but Marquette did such a good job in the half court of pressuring the ball and really making it hard for them to get the ball into Zach E. That's really the only defense you can have for Zach E because once he touches the ball, he's going to score. And I kind of think that, you know, Kentucky – and Miami on Tuesday night, where they had so much success, says uh, the Wildcats did in early in the second half when they broke that game open, was they pressured the ball in the half court. They, you know, Norchad O'Meara, instead of catching the ball for their five out motion action at, at the top of the key, they're pushing it back almost to the UK logo. And that completely flustered Miami to where they were able to force a couple turnovers, get out in the open court couple easy buckets and you could see the landslide of that game how quickly that got away from Miami to where I think Louisville for a team that one has struggled defensively in the half court and one and two has not always been fluid on the offensive end that's something you can do to where that's not you know again I, I've said about eight nine times at this point doing the Rick Pitino all out full court pressing 40 minutes a game type deal but I think that's something to where you can really affect other teams offenses if you're able to just get them off of their comfort comfort zone, get them off of their spots just by two, three, four feet to where you can really affect them, get them out of their rhythm and, and have a chance to have some more success on the defensive end. Mm -hmm. No, you're, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, that's what, that's what they can do. They're not going to be able to, 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 you know, to, to put in a, um, at this point in the year, you're in December and you're not going to change uh, completely flip what you're doing as far as a two, two, one, or whatnot, but you can put in wrinkles uh, to to really change things up, and, and but really be committed to that end, and and then you got to have players. You know that that was the big thing. Um, you mentioned Miami and Kentucky. Kentucky was just absolutely pressuring it, and Miami came a, a bit offensive sensitive. Uh, they weren't scoring. They weren't. You know they were they were they they would turn the ball over or taking bad shots, and all of a sudden you know, Kentucky is just getting out and you're not getting back as you would if you made a basket or if you're scoring. So um, Kentucky was extremely impressive in that one. Yeah, they were. I mean, I mean, uh, you could see it. Like, even when Miami wasn't turning the ball over, they were – they they let the offense dictate what they did defensively early in that yeah. second half. They they really I – mean, I mean, you got to give Kentucky credit. Like, they were moving the ball great. They were, you know, the ones that got into Miami's heads. But they got a lot of wide-open jump shots just from Miami not rotating and kind of – yeah, it was it was stunning to see Kentucky break Miami's will like that. Mm -hmm. But you still expected Miami to get off the mat at some point. It just never happened in that second right. half, which was which was kind of stunning. And Kentucky, I mean, you know, Carolina for about 25, 30 minutes looked incredibly impressive as well. Well, uh, hanging 100 on that Tennessee team, Dalton Connect kind of kind of saved face for the balls a little bit on Wednesday night, dropping 37. That kid, I mean, again, I'm an Indiana grad, and Indiana was in on that uh, on Dalton Connect, and they didn't get him. And I really wish they would have because <laughs> well, that, that he, he's a baller. He's an absolute yeah. baller. <laughs> um, I, I was at the uh, Louisville Bellarmine game, so I didn't, didn't get to catch it yet and, and rewatch it. But you know, it's almost like an NBA score which look North Carolina traditionally can get up there but you're not expecting Tennessee to give up 90 something points you know uh did they get to 100 so they I, did they I, did like, and yeah. it was yeah. it was easy so I um so I I worked at like 9 30 last night I had, uh -huh. I had a Sacramento Kings game I don't think I'm getting in trouble by by saying that so I didn't you're not to get there. So, I'm so you I a pass. thank you so I didn't have to get there until late so so I got to see most of the Carolina game. And then once Louisville popped on, I'm kind of watching both of them. Uh, I had Virginia and, and A&M on, 
on it as well, kind of following all, all three of those. Mm -hmm. And what was stunning for me was in, in that first half, especially how easy Carolina was able to get whatever they wanted. I mean, Tennessee was absolutely shell shocked early in the game. I mean, you know, RJ Davis was getting the lane. Ellie Cadeau was getting to whatever spot he wanted to. They were getting open shots. They were hitting them. And, and it was, I was surprised. Well, I don't, I don't know whether to credit Carolina or, or just kind of say Tennessee didn't really have their normal juice on the defensive end that they that they always mm -hmm. do because Tennessee's so consistent on that end that makes me kind of want to lean towards more giving Carolina credit on that. But I, I, it was stunning how easily Carolina shredded the Tennessee defense, and they they made it look they 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 quite honestly they made it look really really easy to score fifty two yeah. points whatever it was that first half and and, and drop a hundred. I watched them and I watched them in the uh, battle for Lance that they, they, they can definitely get to the rim and score. And they've got, they play with tempo and they, and they, they offensively, they, they look like a great unit. So, but to hang that on Tennessee, that's, that, that, yeah, that is surprising. I'm sure Rick Barnes, uh, their practices the next couple of days, uh, there's going to be, there's going to need helmets and shoulder pads for that one, for sure. I mean, they're, they almost need helmets and shoulder pads when they play most of the time. So I can only imagine what those practices are. are but I mean, like Kentucky, though, that was what Reed Shepard did in that game. I mean, he might play his way into being a one and done. Because he was yeah. spectacular on both ends of the floor, more in that game. Uh, and then kind of the last thing I want to hit on with that was kind of the defense they played on Nigel Pack. I mean, Nigel Pack's mm -hmm. a great player. I he mean, is. He's been, he's yeah. been around the block, block to where, you know, he's he's played in Cambridge Indoor. He's played in the Dean Dome. He's played in Virginia back when he was at Kansas State. He's played in Fog Allen Fieldhouse and all, and all the uh, Big 12 arenas also. So, you know, Rip Arena wasn't going to be mm -hmm. intimidating for him. But it was a combination of of Shepard, DJ Wagner, Dillingham, a dude the arrow was on him at points. They held him to two points. <laughs> like that is incredibly difficult to do on, on that on that standpoint. So I know I know we're a Louisville podcast, but when Kentucky did that to Miami, especially the ACSC challenge, I, I just felt like that's worth mentioning just how impressive Kentucky was in that game. No question. They were taking such individual pride defensively. Um, it showed. It showed throughout the game. So yeah. Very impressive yeah. for the for that young unit. It, it'll be interesting to see how they work back. Whether they get uh, you know Bradshaw or or Big Z or Onyenzo, any of those three, two of those three, all three of those guys, those seven footers, trying to work them into the lineup. I think will be mm -hmm. the next challenge for Cal Perry because their schedule opens up. I mean, they play Carolina here in Atlanta actually, which I'm very excited about. I, I think I'm going to be able to go to that game in a couple weeks. Weeks, um, uh, one way or the other, still, still working on it. But other than that, I mean, yes, they have the Louisville rivalry game, but like, we they they should roll. Like, like, let's be completely honest in that game. But they really don't get challenged other than Carolina until they go to Texas A and M and Miss Mississippi State in mid January. So Kentucky has a shot now to really kind of build some momentum, and if they mm -hmm. get any of those seven footers back, try to work them in against some lesser competition here for the next month or so. Yep. Um, that's the thing. And, and, and they'll figure it out. I think those guys, everybody's worried about how it's going to change the style. It, it It's still going to be playing fast. It's still going to be, those guys will be uh, facilitators. Those guys will be screeners. Those guys will be guys that can defend. So it'll still be, it's not going to take away from the pace of play that Kentucky wants. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the hope. The, uh, I think the only thing that I guess Louisville fans who are hate watching Kentucky, which I'm sure there are some listening to this. We, this I'm sure um, there's plenty. Yeah, yes. Yeah. There's always plenty when it comes to that rivalry. I guess the only hope that, that I'll give you for them is that if Cal Perry goes back to the archaic offense with the bigs that he's had the last couple of years, but I think he's had so much success with what they've been doing this year. I, I just don't see how that's a possibility to, to go back to no. what they've been doing the last few years. He's kind of, I think he's seen the light there, <laughs> there. Um, in well, that standpoint. The, the players have as well. So yeah. that's not going to change immensely at all. Yeah. So, so let me ask you this before we get out of here, here, uh, uh, back, back on Louisville. This will, this will be the last thing we hit on. Um, looking at Kenny Payne, kind of back to the big picture stuff. They're sitting at four and three right now. They have three more very winnable non-conference games in DePaul, Pepperdine, and Arkansas State. Before that, they play at Virginia Tech. And then you get into the ACC play. What is a realistic number of wins you can expect from Louisville right now a month into the season to where they got four already. That, that matches what they did last year. They haven't particularly looked great doing it, but they do have four wins. 
how many wins are you looking at at for Louisville at this point in the season? For the total season, for yeah. for for the whole year. I mean, look at, at this point. The, the 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 one thing you never want with a program is you know to be mediocre. You just you just don't want to be average. That's like the, the it's almost worse than being rock bottom at times. It's just being. You know, I, I know what Louisville fans went through last year and, you know, going into this season, um, you know, you weren't sure what to expect. And, and as of right now, you, you got to get those three non-conference, you know, you, you got to steal. You, you'd love to steal one from from, you know, either Virginia Tech or, or Kentucky, which is going to be. Uh, I mean, if they, were, be easy, if they were to somehow you know? beat Kentucky. Uh-huh. I think that's the only way they could get the fan base to buy back into the idea of getting paid. I mean, yeah, month. look, so, yeah, that, that yeah. that's, that's a part of it, man. It's, it, it's, um, and then I, I went through the ACC schedule. I mean, it's going to be, it's, it's tough. It's tough. You're, you're going against so, some really good teams. You're, you're not, you know, the, the, the ability they're, they're getting to the free throw line so well right now, I think it will continue, but it'll drop off because it just won't be easy to, you know, they're just length and their size. You're not just going to be over overpower and back down guys and guys will wall up and so on. So the number of times they're getting to the free throw line, that's not going to continue. So they've got to be able to be more creative offensively as well. Maybe it's out in transition, you know, uh, just tinkering with some of the half court sets. We've mentioned Tyler. Look, if you look at it, I think, uh, if you're going to be optimistic, I think this team can win 14 to 15 games. Um, if you're going to be, you know, take care of your, your, your three other non-conference games and get to seven, try and steal one and, and hope to, to, to get six or seven wins in the ACC. I mean, that's, that's kind of where, you know, the, the, the bar is. I, I would be surprised if this team wins 10 ACC games. I just, I mean, when I say that, I can see Jack's, you know, your 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 head's about to explode. So I, I mean, um, I mean, just even you know, the fact, the thought of you thinking they can win seven ACC games. I mean, I'm looking at. I, I'm not saying that they can. I'm saying that you know, when you ask me what the number is, I don't want to lowball it. I want to say it from a coaching, from an optimistic standpoint, and saying, okay, if some of the things that they've been doing and they can get better and they grow. I mean, it's all based on growth. Every team, you know, you're not playing your best basketball in November, December. You want to be playing your best basketball in January, February, and then it's March. So if they can, if they can build on this from, from, uh, you know, as a coach, you're always, you know, for me, it's, it's a, a daily self audit and it's just a grind of just you're oozing with desire to get better at what you're doing. And you're just hoping that this team has that kind of mentality and says, we have to keep just driving, driving this point home and getting getting to the point where we can win um to win look uh, you asked me that question to win seven ACC games is that's a that's an arduous task that that is not easy so I mean you know realistically you're probably talking three to five ACC wins um but that's kind of where I'm at because yeah, I kind of got I kind of got that number at because there's just a couple things here I want to add you first of all I, I kind of think you know, first of all, Ken Palm has them losing at DePaul by two. So it's very much a toss-up game, but they have them losing the game. I think they win that game because I think DePaul's a, a very much a mess <laughs> as, yeah. a, as well. Well, so I think they win the three non-conference games. That gets them to seven. You get Notre Dame and Georgia Tech at home. I think you can win both of those. Those That gets you to nine. Beyond that, I just don't see many games. Like, I think they can come up and, like, steal a game against maybe, like, a – um. Uh, maybe like a Florida state at home or an NC state at home. They haven't looked great or like a Boston college, maybe like maybe one or two of those games, like a, or like even like a Syracuse mm-hmm. at home, but I'm not picking them to win all of those games. And, and I, I think kind of like the nine, 10, 11 range is where I have them right now, which to me, if if you're at nine, 10 or 11 wins, it's cut and dry. Like that's it for Kenny Payne. Like you can't bring yeah, it back. But-, those. but if it gets to 14 or 15, like you're saying, that's where, like, like if you're if you're asking me, I don't think 14 or 15 should be enough to to give Kenny Payne a year three. I I just don't. I think you need to be, I think you need to be, you know, contending Jim. for the NCAA tournament for him to get a year three. Well, but that's I that's know, the goal every year. And yeah. Jack, every, everybody's looking at the schedule. Every fan, every 
pundit, you know, looks at the schedule and says, okay, well, you know, this is the number of wins. And, and that's my point. Like, yeah, if you just look at it, you'd say, okay, three of the four wins in the ACC is, is what you're probably from Ken Palm to all those type of things. But if you can make this, if you can just instill a will, a desire into this team and understand that this team can grow, because I do believe there's talent there and you can get and raise it and just somehow just battle and find a way to get to that number, that would be fantastic. Because, yeah, we're all looking at it. And, Jack, I'm with you on that. You look at it and say, okay, these, this game does not win. You know, this is a loss. This is a loss and so on. You got to say, okay, well, if they can find a way to, to, to play like they did in New York and, 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 and steal a few more, sure. But, again, the standard is not to be mediocre. The standard is to be uh, a tournament team and to make an impact in the tournament. Right. Which I think that's kind of, you know, where you go back, you know, being mediocre is the worst thing you can be right now. Cause I think if you win 14, 50 games, you're going to have, you know, the Jerry Eves of the world <laughs> world and, and all the, you know, people that really want KB to succeed. I think everyone, you know, that's a Louisville fan wants him to succeed. Obviously he's the head coach. You want the head coach of the team to win. But if you're at 14, 15 wins after the four and 28 last year, I just don't think that's enough to give him a year three. But I think if he won 14 or 15 games, there might be enough pressure to give him a third year, which I don't think you should do. If, if, um, if he's, you know, gets to like somehow, and I don't think this is going to happen, but if you were to get to like 17, 18, 19 wins, get close to the bubble, maybe get an NIT bid, then yeah, no, you can sell me on that and say you've made enough progress to where you can get a year three. And, and you know, at that point, you better be at the NCAA tournament making a pretty good jump. But but you got to be at least, you got to be flirting with a postseason in, in some way, yeah. shape, or form this year. To, to, for, for me, for, for, for me personally, to have any conversation of, of should you bring him back for a third year. Yeah, like Jack, like everybody can look at it. And if you just from right now on November 30th, you look at the schedule and you're like, how's this team going to get to 17, 18 wins? Right. But that's where, you know, you, you just say, OK, um, your point is well taken. Um, you can look at it. It's not played on paper. you got to go right. out there and, and play these games. And if they can show um, great growth as far as what they're doing and figure things out how they want to guard certain things and offensively and just talking on the macro here and not getting into all the the minutiae and all the details and so on if they can do that then then yeah um they've shown progress but yeah if if you're just going by like you said jack from kempom to looking at on paper yeah this team is is a 12 win team but, right, and um, and that's and that's always a, a dangerous thing to do with college basketball to look at things yeah. on paper because things rarely go like you know, exactly. like like on paper last year Louisville was projected to win 12, 13 games and they won four so it worked very much it worked very much right. both ways Louisville obviously hoping it goes the opposite direction right this year exactly with that. yes which which I think Ken Palm has them at eleven with five ACC wins right now. Now, um, but if you look at like the actual game by game, uh, because you know how it goes to where if if it's kind of a toss up, it says you'll win X amount of these games where technically you're projected to lose by one or two points, and right. then you'll lose a couple of these games. They he only has them projected to win Arkansas State, Pepperdine, Georgia Tech, and Notre Dame the rest of the way. Like I, I think they beat DePaul. I think they'll have chances in other games as well, but I do think it, it's it, it's a tool to use and kind of say, do we agree with it or do we not agree with it at this point? But I do think it's kind of a, a useful thing when helping to kind of project well, out. Yeah, it's helpful. Yeah. And, and and so you're going to find a way to be the Bellarmine in New Mexico State. You got to find ways to beat an Indiana and a Texas. So that applies to the ACC. You know, you can you're, you're just going to find a way to beat those teams just because you can out them. You got to find a way. And, and again, the Texas game. Look, a, a tough uh, – Sky Clark yeah. couldn't have guarded that any better. If they're in that position, maybe they find a way to win a few, string a few together in the ACC, and you just never know. Yeah, which, you know, that's a thing that can happen, though, against good teams. Max Asmus, really good player. He made a play. <laughs> That'll happen. But it'll be interesting, obviously, to see what happens and where this goes the next few weeks, next few months with this Louisville season. And you know what? I'll put it this way. If they keep winning, that makes our job a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah that's we'll be talking sure. about all, that for sure. Yeah, be, it's a uh, lot. Of, yeah. I would much <laughs> rather be doing that than talking about a coaching search. That is that is yeah. for sure. But I'm for Mark you. for Mark Lieberman, I'm Jack Grossman. Grossman, we'll be back um, after Virginia Tech 
on uh, probably record either Sunday night, Monday, something like that. And we'll, we'll be back early next week to react to that. Get ready for DePaul and see what the Cardinals do in their ACC opener down in Blacksburg, Virginia. Coach, appreciate the time as always. And we'll talk to you guys next.